Hey, what's up, guys? It's Rico, CEO of Sourcefine Asia, and I'm back with another one. I'm in Hong Kong. I'm sitting here with Alan Scanlon. Scanlon, yeah, I said it correctly. And uh, we're sitting on the rooftop here at the Pullman Hotel, also the Park Lane Hotel in Hong Kong. And as you can see, we have a lovely view. And in this video, uh, Alan and I talked about his dad's journey into China, 45 years in the sourcing game, built a eight-figure sourcing company. It's a very aspirational, you know, I hope, I, hope, I hope 45 years from now, my kid is out here in Hong Kong making videos about me, <laughs> all right? So without further ado, enjoy the video. What's up world, my name is Rico. I am the CEO of Source Fine Asia. And if you're wondering what we're gonna be up to in 2019, besides me trimming my beard, we're looking to hire a marketing intern for the summer of 2019. So two to three months in Guangzhou, maybe one month in Chiang Mai, Thailand, where my business partner, formerly known as China Mike, now Chiang Mai is located. And basically we're looking for somebody that can help us improve and promote our content. So all of the stuff that you've been seeing on the YouTube channel, social media management, things like that. And then I wanna make more day in the life type videos. And then potentially in Chiang Mai, we're thinking about hosting uh, sort of sourcing, you know, big meetup over there. So if you're interested in applying, go to sourcefinasia.com slash intern. And just to give you an idea of some of the stuff that we've done over the past couple of years, here's a quick little montage for you. So if you like what you see, again, go to sourcefineasia.com slash intern. I, I took a lot of time to write the details into that page about the job post and sort of my expectations. And you can apply through that page. So again, sourcefineasia.com slash intern. And I hope to see one of you guys, anybody's welcome to apply, but one of you guys in China this summer. What are you drinking? I am on the Peroni. On the Peroni. I'm uh, having a choice. I'm having a 
Black, it was a Jack, no, it wasn't Jack, it was a Black Label. Black Label. Black Label. Cheers. Cheers. Happy Christmas. Our first yep. Source Find Asia slash New Land Source and Christmas party. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> so much of a party, it's just the two of us. It might get a little bit crazier later. I hope your company grows <laughs> over <laughs> the next few years. <laughs> yep, for sure. So uh, obviously, you know, we're here in beautiful Hong Kong. You know, we've got that nice little rooftop situation. I uh, wanted to talk to you about your family history. You yep. have a very, very long history in the sourcing game. For, I was 45 years? Uh, yeah, 1973, so yep. I suppose I'll... Well, not I'll, you, but your not, dad. Not me, no, 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 no <laughs> not that old. Uh, I suppose I'll go back. I'll go back to the start, and sort of what I know from, from when the old man started the company. Um, so back in Dublin in 1973, uh, he went out with a friend of his uh, to do their own thing. They had been working in, um, in an importing company run by two Jewish guys, I think, in, in Dublin, and they gave them a bit of backing to go out and do their own thing. So he was coming out to Hong Kong in 1973, um, very, very different place back then, and you couldn't go into mainland China. Mm. So he was dealing with all the sourcing houses in Hong Kong, I think. I think China opened up in 78, 79. So up till then, he was in, you're going to hotels and very different exhibition centers to what there is now and meeting with all these different sourcing houses who deal directly with all the factories yep. in China. Yeah, so and as we were talking about before, that was, a, that was one of the things that I learned early on is if you go on Alibaba, a lot of times most of the trading companies are Hong Kong based yep. and part of the reason is because of that, right? Like history and that, yep. yeah. Um, but again, and, and we kind of alluded to it with the, the quantity, the quantity uh, situation back then again was very different. These factories wanted to sell large quantities, and then you had this guy coming in from Ireland, very very <laughs> small country, uh, trying to sort of haggle and, and get what he can to, to sell at the time, which mainly stationery and toys, uh, but kind of starting a business off, being young, just whatever he could sell. He was he was he was bringing back with them or, or getting shipped back over. Um, everything done by Telex. Um, Telex, uh, that typing system. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had um, I had uh, an Australian guy on my uh, Mark O'Connell on my podcast, and he was talking about that because he's he's been sourcing from China for for a while as well. Yeah, yeah. just yeah. crazy when you think about it. Like we got <laughs> we had emails which sped everything up, and now WeChat's unbelievable. Like they, you get instant replies to everything, but like back then you'd have to send one of these grams or whatever it was called, and it would take weeks. Um, to get a reply. Yeah. So yeah. it's just very, very, very different. Um, very different. I can't imagine that. Like, we're getting to a stage right now where one of the factories is setting up uh, a live feed in okay. on of their production floor oh, wow. so that we can, you know, monitor things that are going on. And I can't imagine having to, like, sell, send a telex, whatever, and then, or, or having to fax no, information, you know? People don't reply to a WeChat with that. <laughs> yeah. Get, you start, you start to freak out, yeah, yeah. And reply to me. Um, and it's only going to get, it's only going to get faster and quicker when 5G comes in. And mm. and China, China's only been open, as we said, since 78, 79. So the difference from then till now has been so big and they didn't have the internet for half of that time, three quarters of that time. So just with the with the expansion of the internet and just with the, the quickness of tele, telecoms and telecommunication, I think, I think it's only going to get better and better and faster. So tell me, so at the beginning, he's coming to Hong Kong, he's trying to source, he's, yeah. he doesn't have large quantities, it's very difficult. What did he do to get these factories to actually, you know, work with him? Well, what? Just really negotiations. So the story he always tells me about, just in regards to quantity, is him trying to buy rulers and then being in a, with one of these sourcing houses, trying to negotiate, I think, whatever it was, 12 cartons of rulers. And then an American guy came in and was trying to negotiate a 20 foot container. <laughs> so factory, like he literally didn't want to deal with them because it's a waste of their time when you're, you're dealing with these other quantities. But as I said, like he, it was product that people were asking for from back home and it was, it was just getting his hands on stuff and then going back and trying to sell it. So he was sourcing goods, coming back, knocking on doors and saying, do you want to buy these toys? Do you want to buy the stationery? So yeah, just kind of, it was just the two of them at the start, as I said, um, five years of, of pretty tough going. He mortgaged a house, a uh, young family. I wasn't around at that stage, but he had four kids mm. and mortgaged a family home. So if the business went belly up, they're losing everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, worked his ass off. His business partner left, decided that he 
didn't want to do it anymore because it was difficult and he was a bit of a bit of a show pony. So he went off. Um, but then, yeah, I sort of grew into it. When the business developed into a souvenir range, someone knocked on the door and literally asked them to source a, a soft toy leprechaun. Yeah. So then that kind of pivoted the business and we started getting into basically anything that you can make green with a shamrock and a leprechaun. We <laughs> do pretty much. You started sourcing anything anything that was green and had a shamrock on it? So yeah, so it kind of led this one guy asking us to source the soft toy. Mm. Um, so literally, you see souvenirs all over the world, right? And depending on what country they're in, what they're focused on. So in Ireland, it's leprechaun, shamrocks and green. Mm. So we do um, keyrings, pens, candles, soft toys, flags, everything and anything basically that you can think of that, that is a souvenir, jewelry. Um, and that was really the foundation of the business. And that's what that's what really grew it. So we were coming out here, we, we brought in sales reps and, and um, uh, a des- uh, I don't want to say designer, sourcer, designer guy who's actually retiring this year. Uh, he'd come in at the start of the business as well. So he would come out and, and, and find a factory that made keyrings and then develop develop a keyring, whatever it was, um, Irish related. And then we'd sell it to the tourism shops in town. Over the years that grew and grew and we bring in designers now. We have, we have five or six in-house designers who would be focused on on, on making our own product and then we get the factories to develop it. But at the start, it was very much, what could we get from another country that did a souvenir and yep. make it Irish type of thing. Um, <laughs> so yeah, just a bit of, just a, just a bit of copying going on. What, what made him, what's your dad's name by the way? James. James, what made, uh, what made James decide to even do this? Like To do his own thing? Um, yeah, I, I like, suppose why, just, why China? Why you know, yeah. like you know, the the company he worked for had a bit of ties, so they were bringing in goods from China. Yeah, um, he he definitely he definitely saw it as an opportunity. Um, not a lot of people were doing it in Ireland back then. He yeah, was kind of he's probably maybe not the first wave of Irish people coming out here, but the second wave. And um, so there wasn't a huge amount of people doing it. Um, and I suppose just ambition. This is a young family and, and wanted to own his own thing. Yeah. Um, like there's big benefits, as you know, like being your own boss. Like you, you got to try to drive the company and do your own thing. But exactly. The rewards are there as well. If you, if you, if you work yeah, it's a, it's a huge risk, especially if you have a family. Like that's, yeah. that's, that's oh, huge. There's four kids. And as I said, yeah. in the house and the mortgage, like I yeah. wouldn't be able to have a boss. Yeah, I, like, I mean, the part of the reason why I was able to do this is because I was like straight out of college. I was like, I have literally nothing to lose. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and, and if I lose everything, it's only on me. It's yeah, it's just, just my pride. That's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, man, that's crazy. So, okay. So he starts to gain traction. Yeah. How many years into the business? So, so, as I said, the first five years were pretty, pretty tough. And then, yeah, so it was about five years. And I mean, that's kind of standard what they say about a lot of companies. Three to five years is, is difficult. Mm. And then you see getting get a bit of results. So they started making a bit of money um, moving from that. But I, I was actually asking my mum this question the other day about when they were really comfortable and when they didn't have to worry about about bills and about, about sort of food on the table situation. So, so by the way, me and Alan are both private school babies yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I came in at a later stage Um, so yeah I mean it was a good she sort of said a good 15 years into the business um, before before they were really comfortable so that's I suppose that's when they when they really started gaining traction Um, and then my my brother my older brother Robbie going into well I guess that depends on what she defines as exactly comfortable yeah. yeah listen like if you're happy but your dad says f- five years roughly that's when he was hard like hard work yeah and, and a lot of stress and the struggle and then things got better mm. yeah. and then at that time period they started to really focus on gifts and decorations uh, or uh, souvenirs souvenirs would, and, would have been the big focus yeah so that really drove the company um up until about about seven years ago when we bought uh, an irish brand called tipperary crystal so Tipperary Crystal is a very famous uh, gift, uh, not giftware, crystal, crystal glassware company in Ireland, about 40 years old as well. But when we bought it, it was 95% crystal glassware. Yeah. And now it's about 5% crystal glassware. So we've 
made a big focus on packaging and a big focus on, on gifting items, so candles, uh, silver plated jewellery, Christmas decorations, uh, gift sets, um, which was a bit of a risk and a bit of a, a change, but we have the brand and we have the brand awareness there. So that's what we kind of really pushed uh, with, with that side. And within seven years now, that's outstripping the souvenir side of the business. Okay. So we still have both of them, yeah. but the growth is definitely in temporary customer. So uh, going off of that, um, 45 years, how has the company changed over that time period? Um, how has he adapted to you know the market and, and all that stuff? I mean, the, the big, the big, I, I, the big change that I would have seen in the business would have been my brother going into the company, yeah. my brother Robbie going into the company, and, and that kind of youth and having having trying different ideas and pushing the company in, in a different direction. And it wasn't too soon after that that my dad stepped back from the business, and he was always very much he wanted to give the the, the business to his family, but wanted us to make decisions or well my brothers at the time to make decisions mm. and to make their own mistakes and to make their own success rather than being involved in it and kind of looking looking from afar and kind of over and, overshadowing yeah, overshadowing which yep. you see what I see with a lot of my friends and their family businesses so he kind of stepped back when, when and my brother took over the, the managing director role I think he was I think he must have been in his kind of early to mid 30s when he took it over mm. and there was there is two other directors who are retiring at the end of this year now who had been there a long time but still the focus was very much on it being a family business and the family should should run it yeah um, so that yeah I, I would see that as the biggest change at that stage but then the temporary crystal thing was a real it was a real, real change pivot. like it was a real so, so did you find like when when your brother stepped in did you start doing um, things a little bit like using more internet Applications like you know yeah, systemizing I mean, things I, I or wasn't in the business at the time so marketing like, or yeah, I, you know. I can't really say exactly what he was pushing yeah but again it was that I mean that was that was in the nineties like the internet was still a very new thing so it wasn't like it was a big a big pivot on using like high tech computers or the, the souvenir side of the business we wouldn't have done a lot of marketing and branding in the past because mm. it would have been a very much of everyone knew who we were yeah so in lots our, of lots of word of mouth. All word of mouth. So in Ireland, there's there's two two main wholesalers for souvenirs, us and a guy called Shamrock. Mm. And then there's about 17 other companies that are all much smaller. So we would control about 50% of the market between the two of us. Funny enough, Shamrock, they were initially the guys who asked us to source the souvenirs. <laughs> so there was a knock on our door, wanted to source this leprechaun. We started sourcing the product for them. And they said we there was a gentleman's agreement that they would um, they would deal with retail and we would wholesale to them, and then that all kind of got a bit messy at one stage and there was a few <laughs> arguments. Uh, so that all went out the door, and then we started we we dealt directly with with the retail as well. So we'd wholesale the product throughout Ireland um, with a small operation in Scotland as well. We do it, have a souvenir company there. Talk to me about um, when your dad first started actually dealing direct with factories. When he actually started going into China, does he have any? Do, can you think of any stories that he's mentioned about what that was like? Because uh, he, 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 he came, he came in like when when he it just opened start, up, right? Uh, yeah. Start, he used to come out because he used to leave. I remember him and mom used to go on business trips for like six weeks. They'd come out here for six weeks. But they were dealing. Oh, your your mom, your mom was it over six weeks? Yeah, yeah. On summer uh, trips, not all of them. Like um, she, she liked it. Um, she loved Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, they used to like they had they have friends out here and they would have done the races and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, jazz. yeah, yeah. Um, not so much. Not so much the mainland. It's, it's funny now. <laughs> they're, they're they're they talk about it with all this like classic sort of oh back in my day. Yeah, yeah. And it was this and it was that and you kind of. I'm sure at the time. Well, like you, you kids have you kids have it easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I've heard a few stories. I, I can't remember where it was, but there was some place where they had to get off a bus, and the bus was blacked out. They were met by um, armed the armed guards or the army off the plane, brought onto a bus that was completely blacked out. This is in this is in mainland. I don't think it was in China. I can't. Remember. It was in. I, I can't exactly remember where it was in Asia. 
I have Korea in my head, but that, that doesn't sound right to me. South Korea, mm. definitely go to North Korea. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, nothing, I can't remember anything from China story-wise. He's had a few, a few, or one incident uh, where they, they got, they got, knocked on the hotel door in, in Korea, knocked on the hotel door by their taxi man they had during the day, and he was like, you guys gotta get out of the country. And they they got on a plane, and there was there was government issues, and the hassle has gone on with the army, this type of stuff, so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, nothing, nothing mm. that springs to mind. That's just just, a, little, very different just a little bit more rugged those yeah, days. Yeah. yeah. But he kind of, he would have done the stuff at the very start, but then as soon as he didn't have to do those trips, it was it was knocked off so he would have stopped doing it maybe after the first 10 years of the business yeah he would have then only come out to like was it visiting friends we had, we had a, a very a long-term friend who was based out in hong kong and she passed away when i moved here but like he had spent time in our house in ireland and i knew him since i was about four years old playing lego and in, in my house things like that um and he'd come out to visit him so just to uh i guess close off this video and by the way, uh, me and Alan are going to do a deep dive on the podcast. So we're going to do a shorter video now, but, you know, deep dive on the podcast. So just to, just to close off, I think, when, when do you come into the business? So I, we, we have two businesses in Ireland. We have Allied Imports and we have Allied International. Started at the same time. Yeah. Allied International, as far as I'm aware at the start, was kind of the, the more focused and the bigger part of the company. And then over the years, Allied Imports outgrew it. So international would only be about, there is at the moment five employees and Allied Imports has 50, 53 I think at the moment. So international is run by my sister Natasha, um, mainly focused on packaging. Mm -hmm. So they're a, a gold, audited gold standard for M&S and they're one of only two in the UK and Ireland who have that. So it's, that's a big, big thing, the order system for M&S very very difficult and very very high standards yeah so i started working with allied international can you can you can you explain a little bit of uh, mns just for the for the watch the viewers so so mark suspensers so basically what we would do for them is uh, high-end luxury rigid packaging mm -hmm. so mainly cardboard a bit of wooden stuff yep um mns say for chocolates in the airports and in shops it's 80 percent down to presentation 20 percent down to content so people look at it and go, that's a nice box. Yeah. And I buy that for my wife or my mother or my mother-in-law, that type of thing. So it's very, very big focus on packaging. Very, very, like... Because they, they're usually buying them as gifts. It's, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's gift wearing. That sort of brings us back to what we did with Tipperary Crystal. We did a big focus on the box. So and having he, a on the box. You, you're blowing my mind here, man. I, here, I was, here I was thinking I was a savvy buyer. Meanwhile, I've been fooled in airports. Meanwhile, they've, they've been marketing to me and I didn't even know. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, big, big, big focus on packaging. Um, like they'd be working. My sister would be working on M&S. She would have done Christmas 2019 by now, um, and then sort of Q1 next year they'll do Christmas 2020. Mm. So very much like very much ahead of schedule. Very very high demands. But when you get in there with these big boys, it leads off to a lot of other companies. So M&S how they operate is. They'd have their packaging supplier and they'd have their food supplier. They yep. put them together and they go, you've got to come up with packaging that fits in with our our trends for this year. Yeah. So for instance, we do a lot of stuff with Artisan Chocolat, a Belgium, Belgium company based in London. They have a couple of shops in London. Gorgeous chocolates and really, really out of the box thinking design wise. So now we have a really good relationship with them through the M&S and now we do all their packaging. Mm. So it kind of links off. We've got a few ties to to cheese companies, we do stuff for Harrods. Um, so some really, really big brands. Um, so I started working there about nine years ago. Yeah. When I moved in into the, into that side of the business. Um, at the time, our focus was Christmas decorations, randomly enough. But then our biggest customer went went um, went out of business during the the, the recession in in 08. So I literally started working. And that recession happened, so my first few years in business were pretty crap. You, you, you were part of that yeah. that, that generation that of people. Um, I was just going into college at the yeah, time. Yeah, it was miserable. But I just I just stopped business. Like I and uh, to be honest, I hated hated working in the company. Yeah. For the first two three years, <laughs> just couldn't stop. I was so excited to start, and then once I got in there, I just 
it just wasn't what I was expecting. I, my big mistake was going straight into that. I should have worked somewhere else and then brought some value to the company yeah. rather than going straight into the family business. Um, so yeah, I think that. What were you expecting to happen when you first jumped I in? I don't know. I was expecting money and everything, you know, <laughs> well and orders. And, yeah. and I always used to love when we get an order. I love that buzz. But then I was always just a bit bored and wasn't really. I suppose it was an age thing as well. I wasn't really driven or trying to do like push my own thing. Yeah. Like that's something that's come with me later on in the business and working and especially since. Also, I'm also you wouldn't know what to push. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know. You don't know whose door to knock on and. And when you're young and dealing with people, uh, and I just, Ireland, Ireland especially, when you're dealing with a lot of people, it's this kind of attitude of, you're a young guy, why would I deal with you? Why yeah. would I listen to you? Um, whereas in Hong Kong, it's completely different. You, you know, know people are more in more impressed that you're young and you're doing and you're, yeah, whatever. You're, yeah, 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 no, that's I, nice. that's I, very I get that. I get that all the time with my clients or whatever. It's like when people ask my age and how yeah. long I've been doing this. It's like everyone's like people are more impressed at the fact that I'm I'm younger. Yeah. Uh, whereas yeah, maybe in some more traditional places, you being young might Work, be yeah, it works against make, you. Yeah. I think people I don't know. take you as seriously. I do think as well. I know in Hong Kong, I don't know Guangzhou exactly, but I know in Hong Kong, everyone out here, you don't you don't meet any bums out here. Like none of your friends are out here just kind of sitting around doing nothing. You you meet bums in Guangzhou. Yeah, okay, no yeah, no yeah, offense, yeah. I love yeah. Guangzhou, but like yeah, you do meet because the thing is like the cost of living. I, yeah. well, so example, um, this guy Nick Ramil, I've talked to you about him, uh, Brink. Yeah, I met Nick. You met him, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, wait, when did you meet him? We meet, is that the same Nick we met? Oh, no, no, different, different. different oh, different, different Nick, sorry. Nick Ramil, uh, Brink. I don't know where their offices are somewhere around here. Uh, but anyways, so he has this thing. He's always like, you can't pretend in Hong Kong, right? Because it's yeah. just it's just so expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he used to teach English in, in China before he started the companies and all that. And yeah, in China, if you're teaching English, you're making $3,000 a month. You can eat at these kind of restaurants all the time like yeah, it's yeah. not but yeah in Hong Kong you can't no, you no, can't no, no. not on $3,000 yeah, a there's, month there, there's no um, yeah. there's no hiding yeah like my my mom and dad were just like recently visiting me my dad turns around he met all my friends but they were like and he was like you'd, you'd, re, you'd, you'd do you'd, you'd get involved in the business with any of those guys they're all really nice they're all really ambitious and I was like yeah cause you just don't meet you don't have those lads who go home and drink every night or smoke weed or play their video games like you just don't have that because people are all driven and, yep. and you have to be driven because if yep. you're not you're, 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 you're getting shipped home pretty yeah, quickly yeah 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 you're gonna um, run, so I do love that about run out of money, money. Yep. Um, but yeah so like I, I was in the company I was in the family business for about 8 years um, like things did get better and you get more into it but it was definitely needed a change and, and, and coming out here was a real eye-opener. Um, I've set up two businesses since I've been out here and didn't plan on doing that. Yeah. Um, like meeting the likes yourself and all these different connections and all these different people that, as we said, are so driven and uh, I just want to get business done and want to want to make some money. Um, yeah, it's, just been, it's, been, it's been pretty cool, pretty mad, pretty mad 18, 19 months. So maybe we can close off with uh, companies that you started since you came out here and then yeah. how we met. So we, I, I initially came out here, which we, we didn't really touch on, sorry, the Tipperary Crystal, we launched an international brand of that, Bailey & Brook. Mm. So same product, same packaging, all that sort of stuff, just a different brand name because we're not running any uh, crystal. So we've launched with that, which has been pretty successful so far. Uh, technically just finished year one and we're in 14 countries. So we're really happy with the growth. Uh, it's gonna be year three, I think, before we start sort of seeing a real turnover, making a bit of money, but really happy with how it's been um, accepted into different different, different distribution areas, different marketplaces. Mm. Um, so when I had come out with the idea of, of launching Bailey & Brock, I had met uh, Cirque du Soleil at a trade show. They really liked our Christmas ornaments, and long story short, I've now produced a range of ornaments for, for Cirque. Uh, essentially Christmas decorations, but they are based on all their, different, all their different shows. So with the success of that, I decided to set up my own company. It was all in part with getting my visa and just and getting set up in Hong Kong. So I set up Newland Sourcing. Newlands was actually the name of the house that I grew up in that my dad mortgaged on the mortgage for the for the business. So um, 
just nice to have something I suppose with a bit of meaning behind it. Um, that's that's about the height of that. And then in the last yeah. two <laughs> to contrast that, I asked Mike one time, like, how did you come up with the name Source Financial? He's like, well, I source things, I find things, and I'm in Asia. And then so what? Well, yeah, so in about well, in, in April, I got approached by a guy in Hong Kong and another Irish guy about uh, this e-commerce project. So Lazada, which is owned by Alibaba, based in Southeast Asia, a uh, big, big e-commerce platform, and they wanted to launch the Bailey Brook brand onto, onto that. So in turn, we've set up um, another company in Hong Kong called IntelliSync. Mm. Uh, in, 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 yeah, I know we'll cut that out, scrap it, and edit that bit. Um, so we set up IntelliSync, um, which is an e-commerce platform and we want to bring different brands going to concentrate in Ireland at the start into the Southeast Asia area. So we have uh, the platform in Lazada, we have the uh, fulfillment center in uh, Shenzhen and we have the whole that um, network distribution, pick and pack fulfillment all sorted and, and located there. Um, so we will handle that because I think the big problem, especially with Irish companies, is they get a bit afraid to export and they don't know how to do it. Mm. So we will basically f- facilitate that. Um, so yeah, that's Newlands, Newlands and Intellisync. And then how did we meet? How did you find me? Um, I found, how did I find you? I was I think it was. A, I think it was the podcast. Was it on? No, sorry, yeah, it was on. It was on uh, on my phone on the podcast thing. I literally was typing in China and business and sourcing. I came across your podcast and started this as that. And then I was looking for something. What was the first thing? Was whiskey. It wooden, was it the wooden box? Yeah, the whiskey box boxes. Yeah. Start? It was funny because um, literally the day before, I just met this guy who um, imports whiskey into China. Chinese guy. Yeah. And he was talking to me about whiskey packaging. He's like, yeah, if you ever have a... Tiger? No, not Tiger. Um, Ray. Remember Ray? So when I was talking to Ray, he was like, yeah, yeah, if you ever have an inquiry about whiskey packaging, like, let me know. Yeah. And I was like, I've never had an inquiry about whiskey packaging, but I'll keep that in mind. And then, <laughs> and then the next day you uh, hit me up and I was like... <laughs> <laughs> what you um, and then what have we done? So we've done, what, three orders for Cirque? We've done our juggling balls? Yeah, uh, two orders for Cirque. Yeah, the uh, first one was split into, sorry, the first one was split into two. Two orders, yeah, the first one was split into two. two. So it was EU, uh, EU and the US, and then now another e- EU order, right? Yeah, yeah. And then, and then two orders for uh, Glendalock. With the bags, the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And with the bags. Got, I mean, we've got... Uh, there's been like another thing that I can't... The beach towels. Oh, the beach towels for Craig. Uh, yeah, Broadway, yeah, yeah. Um, Broadway show. Yeah, and then... It's fucking Hamilton, right? Like, Hamilton, yeah, there's the a little store, the I've Hamilton. Never, I've never seen it. So. Um, Lin Manuel Miranda's. Um, what else is there? Like, I, this, I think there might be one more thing that I'm not thinking about, but. But we've got loads. That's of that's cards. that's quite a bit, even just for you know for six, month, pretty much six months, because we only. I think the first order started in the summer. Like the first order that we because the whiskey's been up and down for yep. a long time. Yeah. They kept changing their minds and shapes and designs and yep. everything and being a general pain the ass. Um, but yeah, listen, I, I think there's lots, lots of moving forward because it seems to be working. I was talking to someone the other day about it. I was like, I've got a certain amount of factories that I can use directly from the souvenir business, from the packaging side of things, mm. um, from the ornament side of things that I already have. But then when I have someone like Sir who get onto me and go, I need this light for Blue Man Group, like for me to try and find that. It'd be going on to Alibaba. It's a, it's a process, man. Very, very difficult. It's a process, yeah. Yeah, having you guys in 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 the heart of it is just a real, real, um, real strength to have. So I mean, it's work that I'd be bringing the clients to the to the to the table. Yeah, and it's it's work. awesome. It's awesome for us because like, I I like I I think I've told you this in the past, and I told Mark because Mark is similar. Mark is he has a sourcing company in Australia, and um, I love working with other sourcing companies that are based in other countries because. You understand the process yeah. and you always come to me with relevant information. It's never, I, like we rarely have to ask you for more information, you know? So it's just, it's, it's, 